First of all, I found out I could draw when I was eight years old. Mm -hmm. We pooled our talents and formed Hanna-Barbera. Oh, I get it. All we're doing is laughing, but we're having such a good time. <laughs> I think that's really the secret. Mm -hmm. We worked that way for many, many, many years. <laughs> Bill and Joe's relationship, uh, I saw them as they were two guys who, who worked together like a machine, and Bill had his area of expertise and Joe had his. They were, like, totally different. Joe drove a black Cadillac, Bill a white Lincoln. Bill's office is all light colored, lit up beautifully. Joe's just like a nightclub. The, the example of perhaps a, a married couple who know each other so well that they're finishing each other's sentences and speaking in shorthand and such. Yeah, Bill would, like, run production at the studio. Joe would handle the creative side of things. And they worked together beautifully and such harmony. They really liked each other. Both of them had the capability of functioning in a way where there was no question as to who the bosses were. But at the same time, uh, they were able to uh, establish and... Uh, continue to sustain a relationship with, with the personnel there. I respected both Bill and Joe so much. I, I, I was so in awe of them as a kid. And then when I was working with them and I would see them walking down the hall, I, I just thought, these men don't need to work anymore. They have this enormous company with their name on the top of the building. And yet they would be there at work every single day. He was always telling about how the name Hannah and Barbera came along, where he said he really preferred it to be Barbera and Hannah. Barbera and Hannah would look great on the top of the building. You'd be my guest. Oh, sure. And then at night, he takes this, he went up to the roof on the building and he'd switch the names around. You know what he used to do? When I left <coughs> town on a trip, he'd, take, he'd <coughs> put the lights out behind my name. <laughs> yeah, all that was up there was Hannah. Uh -huh. well, what I did was when they get up on the roof, I had to take the sheet off of my name that he had put on the day before. The show was, in addition to being the producer and creator of many of the shows, was the head salesman. And he would go to the networks every year and peddle his shows. Well, come right in, sir. It's showtime, showtime, showtime. You ain't nothing but a badge of town. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Joe Barbero was relentless. He would go to New York with one little drawing and sell a whole season of shows. Sometimes we'd do presentation storyboards where Joe would work out a script and we'd storyboard it and he'd present that to the networks. Well, Joe was a really the uh, creative head. He ran presentation, he worked under Joe, and we would make drawings and they'd go into Joe for approval. And Joe also had his hand in production, too. Bill, on the other hand, physically ran the studio. Once the show had been sold to the network, then Bill would take over. Uh, there was a transition there from creation to production, and it needed to be separate. But yes, Bill ramrodded. Uh, he was very good at it, too. This time, we put our foot down. Yeah! If a show was ready to ship, or was needed to ship time-wise, and it wasn't done, Mr. Hanna would roll up his sleeves and do whatever it had to be done to get that show shipped on time. He was remarkable. He worked and worked and worked right beside everybody. While live-action production is, is collaborative to a, an extent, animation, for me, is much more so. Between the artists, the visualization of uh, a location or the characters, the voice actors, the writers, the director, everyone is working on the material in a way at the same time. And one discipline is influencing another discipline. Bill has set up a system that was so efficient. What you do is you do all the pre-production here. So from script to storyboard to models to color key to style of the background, they even had a how to paint a background. When he and Bill had the MGM studio, making Tom and Jerry's, Joe would do all the layouts. And he did the storyboards, too. And Bill, people didn't know that Bill was a, wrote music. Besides running the production company, these are very talented guys. Mr. Barbera used to bounce ideas off of me all the time. 
Joe would work in scenes. He would have flashes of gags or scenes, and my job was to take note and try to knit them together. Oftentimes, we would get the storyboard, and Joe would mark with his red ink, uh, see me, Joe. Come on in, we're about to start. Animation is not in the limelight, you know? You don't, people don't see you. You work in a desk, you work in an office, and you create on paper, and nobody sees you doing that. So there's no glamour in reality. It's just hard work and teamwork. Uh, before I had gone to Hanna Barbera, they told me, oh, this is a sweatshop. You don't want to work there. But when I went in there, it was just busy, 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 like a beehive, and I found this is where I want to work. As long as you gave them the numbers, they like to get 100 feet of film out of the animators a week. That really made for some giddy times around the studio. To break the ice, I guess, they, they used to shoot rubber bands off the ceiling so it would drop right onto your head. They were always teasing each other. They even had a bucket of water up on the door. And whenever anyone would come through that door, They'd get a bucket of water, and they'd laugh and just carry on. All I can say is, like, don't open that door. <laughs> so it wasn't all work. We, we all played around a lot, too. <laughs> that was a time when the animation theatrical business was, you know, major studios had discontinued making those films, and there was this flood of talent around. And uh, Hannibal Bear is going into TV with the animation, so the studio was packed with all these great artists and animators and writers and musicians and editors. There was, I think, one season we had 14 different shows. Can you imagine? And each, each show had like 13 segments. And we just got an awful lot of shows that year. And we went from doing 1,200 feet a week the previous year, to all of a sudden we had to produce 5,000, maybe 50, 200 feet a week. And we became an enormous factory of cartoons. We were making, recording, two, three, four episodes a day, five days a week. We had a true assembly line in the studio. And that's how we were able to get so many cartoons out so fast. You know, there, there's quite a range of characters at Hanna-Barbera. There's Johnny Quest, and there's Huckleberry Hanna, and the Flintstones. That's quite a range of style. Not all artists could cover those bases. So we would hire people who would specialize in either funny or adventure style. What you do here? The design of the characters, there, there were big, easy characters, colorful characters, bright colors, limited movement, but funny stories, funny gags, funny situations. Get it down on paper, make it funny, and people will watch it. So each show had a lot of designs to be done, and not only single drawings, but turnarounds and, and uh, action poses. So it kept us all really busy. Model sheets are for the animators to look at so they know what the character looks like from all sides. They do a turnaround on the characters and all the props that the story needs, and uh, model sheets are all cleaned up with a nice line. When I was doing layouts, I never drew a character without the model sheet in my hand. I never relied on my memory because if you do that too often, the character won't look like the character. It looked like your version of the character. Well, usually we would start with just trying to design the characters, what they're going to look like. And, you know, whenever I would uh, design or create a character, I tend to do a overweight characters like myself. But one time Joe said to me, he was leaving the cubicle, he said, hey, stop making all the characters fat like you. The first character that I'm aware of, of having designed for Hanna-Barbera, was on the Flintstones a character called the Great Gazoo, who was a character from outer space. The next major one was uh, on the Jetsons, and it was the dog, Astro. Uh, those are the two that were probably the, the major early character designs that I created for Hanna-Barbera. Follow me! 
Jean, there's another warlock on the loose. The writing was uh, all done on storyboards. There wasn't anyone there who just typed out scripts. We didn't even go like to an outline stage. My first assignment when I showed up was to report to Mr. Barbera's office and for us to figure out what the pilot episode of the Jetsons would be, bringing it back into syndication. The logos were my designs. I am proud to say, for instance, I designed the signature logo of Hanna Barbera. That was based on uh, Joe's and Bill's signatures. Now, prior to this signature logo, we had a star logo, but that was not really the official logo. They wanted to see the word Hanna-Barbera more predominant. I got a great idea, Scoob. You go first, and I'll be right behind you. Uh, Ewo and myself and another fellow named Jack Huber, we were a layout team. They used to have teams of three people per episode. So we'd each do an act. It would be like three acts for the half hour show. As a layout artist, initially we do the blueprinting of the film. We do a lot of the planning for the animators, like camera moves and uh, where you would truck in and pan and uh, scene cuts. And then, of course, set up the characters in poses and make sure it's all modeled. At Hanna-Barbera, um, we uh, did the inking with a brush and ink instead of with a pen and ink and a stylus to hold down the cell. And uh, we wore a glove on one hand, but the fingers were cut out because that's where you held the brush. We would get the drawing, put it on a board, put a piece of cell on top of it, and then ink every drawing. And then from there on, it went over to the paint department. Uh, Bill Hanna and his father made a lot of the ink and paint desks. All the ink and paint girls had desks, I think, that Bill Hanna and his father made. Bill was very talented. He's actually quite a musician himself, uh, a singer as well, and he composed. Kids, I'd like you to meet my pianist and arranger. He's the best in the business. Bill would just kind of give Hoyt a, just a couple little lines, like uh, Flintstone, here's Flintstone. You'd be toiling away on this show, and lo and behold, a lyric would appear on your desk, and you'd get a little phone call from Bill saying, yeah, I worked on, uh, I worked on this lyric, uh, and I kind of had this idea for the melody. Uh, you might want to consider this for your show. It was great. What is it? <laughs> it's the sound. He was after the music. I don't get it. What's so important about this song? When I was a kid, and the minute I heard that music come on, I'd come like a lightning bolt to the TV set and just, I'd be glued to it. You hear that, that theme song, it, you perk up and you come running to catch the show. And I think Hanna-Barbera cartoons had that hallmark. When you think about the Jetsons' main title, or Johnny Quest main title, or the Flintstones, uh, or Yogi Bear. Those main title songs were catchy and they, they brought you running. I hope we're not too late for the recording session. Well, I call it the golden age of, 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 of voiceovers for animation because uh, those people who in the 40s and 50s and even 60s were, were doing a lot were now getting on, but this we had them for this last decade and we had Mel Blanc who was, you know, extraordinary. We had Frank Welker. Hey, look at this. And we had Casey Kasem. Like you can say that again. And we had, you know, B.J. Ward. I think we've stumbled onto a mystery. And we had uh, Don Messick. And boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. A lot of my voice heroes. And this was the first studio that ever hired a full-time voice director. Voice acting is a very exacting, very precise, and demanding skill. The greatest actors in the world do voiceover. They really are extraordinary interpreters of the written word, and they turn your ears into eyes. I loved it when the voiceover actors would come in, especially Jonathan Winters. He was so funny. When I first met Dawes Butler and he did the voice of Huckleberry Hound for me, I burst into tears because there was one of my heroes speaking to me. Of course, everyone, I'm sure that they've heard the story about Frank Welker falling off his stool. Put his legs inside the stool 
and started getting very animated and tipped over, could not get his feet out from under him and just crashed out. Come on into the control booth, gang. You can listen from there. The great thing about working with these actors is they could come in and turn my concept around like that and I'd hear something that would really make me laugh or really touch me in some way. Scooby, you got one! I know, I know. So it's a good idea to have a concept, but also a good idea to be willing to give it up. One day, apparently, Joe had uh, Scatman Crothers in to perform some other voice work and, and just in, on a whim through a, a test series of lines of uh, Hong Kong Pui. And uh, we just flipped. We thought that was the funniest thing, and it was a great way to go. Oh, my gosh. That's great, because it's so, uh, you know, out of left field. And, uh, you know, rather than the, you might say, the uh, Bruce Lee imitation voice or whatever, you know, you had this Scatman sound, which was great. Working with Gordon was wonderful because he was prepared and had, uh, they would rehearse the show and come in and we would just go through it. And everyone knew what they were supposed to do. Okay, Ian, give us a level. First of all, it's the casting, which takes a while. You have to cast the parts and get approval for each part. And then you get the actors in the studio and I've got a script or a storyboard in front of me and we rehearse them first and they go through whatever they're going to do, and I make any corrections or additions that I think I need to, and the producer might give me some notes. And then we start recording, and we record until we've got it all the way we want to. And back in those days, it was all on, on audio tape, too, so that took a little bit more than recording digitally. They were having, like, one hit series after another. Hey, and don't forget Scooby. Scooby-Doo was a big, huge hit. Welcome, kids. Come on in. Scooby-Doo show was based on this uh, hit TV show called The Mod Squad. Well, they had a bunch of kids uh, driving around solving crimes, and they had this old automobile. Uh, we'll meet you guys in the mystery machine. <laughs> when we designed the mystery machine, Ewo brought me the uh, drawing. It looks like a Volkswagen bus. And he asked me to decorate it. In those days, the, f the flower children were prevalent. So I decided to decorate it with flowers. Good work, Shaggy. Just leave the driving to me. Whoa! Leave the driving to you, huh? During the first couple of seasons, I designed all of the lead characters, of course, the, you know, the four kids and Scooby himself. We all had trouble with drawing Scooby. I mean, Scooby was a, a realistic dog as compared to a stand-up huckleberry hound. You know, when you look at a Scooby, you don't realize that maybe six layout men worked on that or 12 animators. It looks like one person did it all. That's because of the model sheet, which was a control for everybody. Like for one Scoob, we got the best of the deal. <laughs> The Scooby cast is a fun group to work with. They're all very familiar with each other. Frank, who's been Freddy the entire time, is a real nice guy, just great to work with. And uh, Casey is always very proper and just wants to do his work. <laughs> You two. Shaggy and Scooby together were quite a team, unusual team, because they're both goofy and funny. You'd think you would have one guy straight and the other guy f funny. Uh, but did, in this case, it was two comedians <laughs> all be falling over themselves, getting scared and running. I think like that's our cue to hit the road, right, Scoob? What? You know, it's a great show because I guess the kids got used to the idea that, that the monster was really the landlord or, or somebody else, and they would pull that hood off at the end. They knew it was going to end up OK. Like, hi! <laughs> I think that Scooby was more popular than Mickey Mouse around the world. He's very popular still. Oh, it's nothing. It was a real cartoon studio. They were still inking and painting. They, were, they still had the cells, the backgrounds. It smelled like a cartoon studio. <laughs> huh? Isn't that delicious?
delicious. For me, it was pure fun. It was also putting out a product that I, that I always felt did some good in the world. And it was more laughs than I ever hoped to have in my whole life. Oh. <laughs> I have always enjoyed what I have done. I have had fun all of my life working. Some of the folks from Hanna-Barbera, no matter what they did or have done or doing now, no matter how old they are, I think we're all ki still kids. If your product has a good story to it, it bears repeating. In a cartoon, if it's a funny situation, you can play it again and again. Why? It's Dr. Grimsley. And again. Oh no! Like here we go again. Scooby Dooby Doo. -doo.